that had that happen? That was a dark. I'm not going there, just thinking about it. What? It was an Abrus, like awful. Good morning, Gospel Life. We're going to get started. And I want to be at a place, and I I hope you agree with me to be in the same place, of where I can lay things down, my thoughts, my ways, the, the things that I'm demanding out of life, or the things I want or think are necessary in life. Um, just to lay them down for a moment and not have things to go my way, but asking the Lord to show me his way so I can start doing that instead. And sometimes it's really hard, especially with the way life goes. It kind of repeats like Groundhog's Day. It's repetitious. And sometimes we need to break that kind of addiction or chain in our life and take on something new. So look, Can we pray for that? Let's stand up together. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are merciful. You are rich in love. You are rich in mercy. And you are rich in grace. And you wait patiently as a a true lover does. You don't demand your way. You wait for us. And sometimes we're just sitting there in the darkness. And you come in the darkness and you meet us there even. Even when the light just hurts us, or the truth, or whatever it is and that's happening, even when it hurts us, you're, you're just there. So, Lord, help us unify and just laying our life down and picking up the life you left behind for us. You call that life to be good. You call that life to be just. You call that life to be truth. And the only way we can receive those things those truths and that kind of life is by taking on yours. So, Lord, help us see your way. Prepare our hearts. Let us hear you speak today. No matter who is up here speaking, Lord, let us be able to hear you speak through that person. Give us ears to hear. We claim this in Jesus' name. Sometimes I fall to my knees and pray, come Jesus, come, let today be the day, sometimes I feel
Someday he will come And we'll stand face to face Come lay it all down Cause today Bye. might be today The time is right now There's no need to wait Your past will be washed By rivers of grace Come Jesus, come We've been waiting so long For the day you return To heal every hurt And right every made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we have a place to worship. I thank you mostly for your son, Jesus, who you have sent to reconcile us to you. Father, I pray that you will use these offerings to send the gospel forth and to use us as is your plan. We know it is the Holy Spirit that moves people. You call people, but you have put us in your work. Father, give us the desire and the opportunities even this week to share Jesus with someone else. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, so are you weary and troubled? darkness you see there's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free through death
turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face.
amazing grace the earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine yes. will be forever Good morning, everyone. All right. Uh, I'm just going to let you know that my wife and I are going to take off really quickly after the worship. We have family coming into town, and uh, they are traveling, and we need to be, so we'll, we'll leave probably right after, after worship. Uh, Let's pray and ask for the Lord's presence here. Father, thank you that we can come into your presence. Uh, Lord, just want to confess that often we are uh, stubborn and uh, hard of heart. And uh, Lord, sometimes I think uh, we struggle just to see the obvious thing, and so we express gratitude for your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would uh, intervene uh, and overturn uh, those areas where we resist uh, submission to your will. Lord, we are uh, we were reminded a moment ago that you are capable of meeting every need. Lord, we ask that you would do that uh, in our lives. Lord, we are also reminded that we are to bring the gospel to people. And uh, Lord, it just seems so fitting that those two things, uh, reminders, just fit so well together. So Lord, I pray for your your spirit, pray for your presence, pray for your, Lord, mainly your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, hmm. I'm thinking, I'm just thinking. Uh, Uh, what I realized last Wednesday is I don't get a chance to teach everybody. There's so many other things to cover with church, and uh, Wednesday I don't get everybody there. And there's uh, one of the groups that doesn't come on Wednesdays; they do on they go Tuesdays. Um, so I'm tempted to do a reminder of what we did a little. Just I can't do everything. Uh, just do a quick reminder because I, to me it was one of the most important teachings that that we've given, and. Uh, I just, there wasn't very many people to hear it, which is kind of sad, because uh, it, for me, it's like it's the idea, we need to move through things as a church. Just the two things that we're reminded of a moment ago, that we are, that God doesn't have any needs of his own, and, you know, I, I would kind of quibble at that, and, I know, you know, I want to look at the Hebrew on that psalm, uh, because, you know, God, does he have needs? Theological question? He will? He has a will? Oh, he has a will. But does he have a needs? Will needs people. But how can it not be? Yeah, okay, I like the way you're thinking. I do. I, 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 I would want to say that if God has need, if, I say if, just to be careful. If God has needs, he's meeting those needs in and of himself. Does, he have, does God have a need for love? 
I mean, certain, he has access to infinite love. What? Desire. 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 Our desire? Yeah, he expresses that. Uh, is that a need? So if we're made in his image as likeness, we have needs. Uh, but the thing is, the difference between us and God is we're not infinite, we're not eternal. It's not in our very nature to exist. So uh, we do have needs. Uh, so I'm just going to do, a, I guess, a, if, before we get to our, our message this morning uh, and to our communion, the Lord's table, just so you know, the way the New Testament works, we get access to the Lord's table through baptism. And we call it around here, believer's baptism, is, is, is our entrance into the Lord's table. And those two ordinances, some people call them sacraments, they're communicating the same things. The resurrection and our, inter- the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus and our entrance into the body of Christ. So those two things get together and we want, we want to celebrate this morning and it's a declaration to the powers of darkness uh, of just whose side you are. And I'm just going to ask you, whose side are you, like, are you on? Does that get you fired up, the idea of you want to dec- declare whose side you are on? That's what we're going to do with the, celebrating the Lord's table this morning. So, I'm going to try to run quickly here, because, you know, <laughs> sorry, I'm still processing. Some of us are, uh, we're still resisting, we still throw up excuses for, for not wanting to do what the Lord is calling us to do. And I'm not calling anybody out, I do the same thing. It's in our nature. Um, you know, you think about our nature, whether it's in our nature to be fearful and afraid and doubting. It's in, our, it's in our nature to not like change. It's in our nature to resist. And, you know, off, what we're seeing in Scripture is God is wanting to bless us, and we're like, we're trying to go every which way but, but His blessing. So I'm going to, I want to remind us of a few Scriptures this morning. And we're going to get there at the end of this. I'm going to set up the scriptures with just some stuff that science is bringing into us. Uh, I like uh, as, much, as many books as I can get my hands on that are going to teach me some truth, because all truth is God's truth. Gabor Mate's uh, last book, uh, what's it called? I'm forgetting the name now. Uh, he says, the essence of trauma is the disconnection from yourself. Now again, I, I'm saying this because I want to get to some, some scriptures and realize that God is your maker, as your creator, has been telling you, commanding you to do something, some things this whole time, and it's like sometimes we just don't do them because we don't see the relevance of them. The idea of, let, here's where we're going to go with this, let's say we have two options. Before we've talked about bitterness versus compassion, bitterness towards your enemy or compassion for your enemy person that hurts you the most, let's say. What if we say now we have two other options? We have worry or prayer life. Which do you have? Primarily. So it, your worry life is an indi- or we could say your rumination life is an indication of your lack of prayer life. Do you see how those things go together? And, and, and what that is, is a declaration, it's an acknowledgement, it's, it's God revealing to you how you work in your soul, and he knows because he created you. Now, the essence of trauma is a disconnection from yourself, the idea of you got to, we, and we do that, we compartmentalize things that have happened to us, and we, we shut ourselves off from them because the pain is too much, it's too great. And so he, I like his two categories because, like, so what we talked about is the ACE quiz. You guys are familiar with the ACE quiz, the Adverse Childhood Experience quiz that the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and Kaiser Permanente Hospital System came up with. It's 10 questions, and the idea is it highlights where, as a child, a person may have encountered um, trauma. But it's, it's the overt trauma, the, the, the trauma that everybody knows about, that we think of. So, you know, sexual or physical abuse. Uh, but he also gets into emotional and psychological abuse. Uh, 
so those are the obvious things. And, and what, what the studies that have come up uh, and what we're seeing now is that there's a connection between soul wounds in our childhood and physical maladies in, in our adulthood. The idea is this, and there's scientific evidence for this. Is, this is no longer like, I th- it's a hypothesis. Th- no, it, we know this to be true. Uh, trauma left unaddressed that doesn't experience healing or cleansing, reduces your lifespan and leads to disease. So, uh, so people get sick, depressed, anxious. I'm not saying, okay, so when I'm going to list these things, I'm not saying that this is necessarily A equals B. There, there could be other factors involved, okay? But this is a pattern that we should be aware of because... I, I know there's people even in our church that lifespan has been cut short because unaddressed wounds, trauma from childhood. I go to funerals and I do hospital visits, and so I'm very keen to these patterns of behavior. So sick, depressed, anxious, cancer, autoimmune disease, obesity, lack of physical activity, missing work, addicted to pharmaceuticals, smoking, suicidal, STDs, heart disease, stroke, COPD, that's pulmonary, broken bones, diabetes. And the idea is because the pain of not being yourself is too much. So uh, the idea of where we compartmentalize, our brain is fragmented because we want to compartmentalize the pain so we never have to address it because it seems so natural if something hurts us to like pull your hand back away from the pain. But the idea of soul pain is you have to run to it in order to heal from it. That's very counterintuitive. So he sets up these two soul needs, and we have a whole list of these, but here's the two he, he uh, boils it down into. The idea of authenticity and attachment. The, uh, here's, attachment means we realize as humans, without attachment, as a little baby, you're going to die, right? You have to have people feed you and put shel- give you shelter, right? Or you die. We understand this? The other soul need, and so we need human relationships. And again, I always have to point out that the reason why ultimately we have attachment needs is because you are made in God's image and likeness. God exists in community, therefore you have a need for community. This kind of brings us back to our question, does God have any needs? To get, get us thinking. The other, the other thing is authenticity. What is this? The idea that you can express yourself. And that, now here's the thing. A lot of times in our families, we, weren't, we, don't, have, we don't have the permission to uh, express ourselves as far, and I'm, I want to be specific here. The idea we don't have the permission to express our negative emotions. Or, and or, we have permission to express our negative emotions. It is def, it's just that it's, it's just not done in a, in a healthy way. It's very dysfunctional. It's, that is to say, it's destructive. It's debilitating. It, it tears families apart, and there's different ways of coping with that. One way is the, is the black sheep scenario. We choose a black sheep, we heap all the guilt on that person, and though, so we get atonement that way. The, the thing that emerged, and you know who you are, uh, a question was asked and then a statement was made after the teaching time last, last Wednesday, and it just, I thought it was such a great statement. The, I, it, it, was, it was an aha moment for the person, and I so appreciated hearing it. Again, you know who you are, and I so appreciated it. it was, is the idea is, wait a minute, you can express your negative emotions in a healthy way? You can express negative emotions in a positive way? Do you see how those two things go together, counterintuitive maybe? But yes, and not only can you, but you must. Again, we're, we're getting to some scriptures. Welcome. Alesa, welcome. So we have those overt things, those overt like traumas as a child, but then, but then here's the thing, here's what I want to highlight this morning. This idea that we have these more subtle things, and the idea that someone can learn, okay, so let me, let me back up just a little bit. The idea of if a child learns that the parent's emotions matter more than theirs, I say emotions, negative emotions, then what, they ha- what they're doing is it's a role reversal. They, the child becomes a surrogate parent because they have to manage the parent's emotions. Dad's upset or mom's going to be hurt, or whatever it is. So the, the child learns that they have to manage the parent's emotion. Therefore, they are, are acting or functioning as the parent. Role reversal, again, we call this, they become in some sense a surrogate parent. So meanwhile, they're, they're, they're getting closed off from how they're feeling. 
what we're saying, so they go into one of two things. It's very similar, the idea of repressing the negative emotions they feel or suppressing them. And what can happen, so suppressing the idea of I know I'm bottling it up, but repression may be even more dangerous, the idea of I've been bottling up so long, the idea that I'm even bottling it up has gone subterranean. It's gone subconscious. I don't even realize it. And again, this is a study that we pointed out is they put electrodes on uh, people's skin to measure the electrical signals, and then they had them look at some graphic images, like someone having their arm amputated, which, and they would say, no, it doesn't bother me at all. I'm fine. But meanwhile, the needle was going off the charts to the idea of uh, they were certainly had a physiological response to it. Meanwhile, they're telling themselves they're not bothered. So, and he goes on to say this. He's like, people are often praised in their obituary for the very thing that killed them. Oh, my wife was such a sweet person. She, we never had any kind of fight. Okay, so she, that's... that's that's not po- so she would have been repressing or suppressing her, her negative emotions for that whole marriage? So the idea of this soul wounds, here's the overarching idea is this soul wound makes it way, its way out through the body trying to communicate to you because the normal check engine lights weren't working. Okay. Oh, here, here's, this, is, this would have been so much shorter just to read this. Uh, so he's pointing out that this is, for instance, one example. This is where people-pleasing comes from. People-pleasing is the learned behavior of giving up authenticity for attachment carried on into adulthood. You are liked, but you're not loved because people don't really know you. You became your parent's emotional caregiver by suppressing your own feelings. So the idea of repression, suppression, the emotions going beneath repression, emotions going beneath the level of consciousness. So, for instance, um, okay, so now having said that, okay, so what I'm arguing is this. There, the journaling process we're doing now, it's, it's, it's addressing the past, And then we're going to get into the present, and then we're going to have to do the future. Because you need to live out of the future that God is calling you to, not just out of the past that you're uh, trying to stay out of uh, survival mode from, fight or flight mode from. But you're easily being triggered, hence flooded, repetitively through what life's throwing. That means you're living out of your past. And if you you wonder if you're doing that, uh, then look at how you handle... And we asked ourselves this question last Wednesday. uh, When's the last time you got upset? What caused you to be upset? Was it a small thing, big thing? How did you handle it? How did you deal with it? Did the way, so if, let's say you, 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 it was a a big, big emotional event, uh, whether it was triggered by a small petty thing or something substantive, did it cause you to flash back to acting like your immature self? Did you act like a child? Oh, no, no, I was so mature in the way I expressed my anger. We're, yeah, so maybe, or maybe you didn't express it at all. But sometimes, because there, there's like this connection going back to the idea of, yeah, that's when I first learned that pattern of behavior. That's when I first started having to compartmentalize. That's when I first started having to suppress and repress to deal with life because I was having to choose uh, attachment over authenticity. And then here's the thing. We don't want to just look at, at, uh, at ourselves. We want to look at the loved ones around us. So I'm going to read. I'm going to give you a course of action. After I uh, read these scriptures. So you say, well, Timothy, why are you talking about all this stuff? We're here to learn the Bible. Right? We're here to learn the Bible. What I know is you can spend a lot of time in a church learning the Bible and it never gets rubber meets the road traction. Meanwhile, people's lifespan being cut short because the gospel's never applied. I'm not a fan of that. That's what I call religiousness. That is, that's self-righteousness. It's kind of what, what I see as Jesus condemning with the eight woes in Matthew 23. Matthew 23. 
And yet we're just reminded of that psalm where God doesn't have any needs and he meets all of our needs. Now, when Diane read that psalm, the way she read it, I don't know what translation that was, but it didn't put any restrictions on the needs that God is capable of meeting. And some of us are thinking like, wow, there's so, I can't be myself to God. He would be offended. News flash for all of us, God already knows you better than you know you. If you're not being honest with yourself, if you are steeped in self-deception, God already knows the real you. There's a sense in which God can love you more than anybody can because he is able to actually see and know and understand you past all the self-deception, past all the facade, past all the image. That is why it's so freeing, the idea of it's humbling to know God because he sees past the image I'm throwing up to everybody else and everybody else fooled by. But yet, it's, 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 it, it's not just humbling. It gives me this confidence and, and sense of everything I, my soul needs because he embraces me in spite of my lack, which I've been trying to hide from everybody. And if he loves me, everything else is going to be all right. Everything else is going to be all right. Now, I need to appropriate that love and and flesh it out and work it out. And often we don't. We turn to some other thing instead of having what? Instead of having a relationship with God. Meanwhile, this is how we... I need to get back to the ranch in a second. But this is how we need... uh, We are to give the gospel to people. This, all I'm describing is... Again, I'm going to read these scriptures. All I'm describing is having a relationship with God. That's all I'm talking about this whole time. And if you don't have a relationship with God, what do you have to offer to anybody else in evangelizing? What is God doing for you lately? And what I realized too, just a quick side note, is people don't come to their religion, whether it's atheism or Christianity or Buddhism or Hinduism, it's like, it's not often the, the, the intellectual side that draws, it's, it's something else happening on the soul level. And, I, and there's a lot more that could be said there, but what I, I think is important is for children growing up in our homes to stay, if they're going to be attracted, if they're going to become a Christian for the next generation, it has to be something they're attracted to because of the beauty, not just because of the duty. It has to be something transcendental that, like, I want that because it's not something else the world can offer. And, and the large part of what the Scripture is giving us that God actually desires, which is mind-blowing, is a relationship with us. The whole point of the Psalms is God's presence satisfies. I just summarized the whole of the Psalms. The psalmist is very upset when God's presence seems to be withheld from, from the psalmist. And I say, we must become the psalmist. But if our children need to see us crying out to God, having a relationship with Him. Now, I said all this to say, get to this point. Philippians 4, 6 says this. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Okay, great. I, I read my verse for the day. Close it. Now we can get to work. Go to, go to my job. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Okay. Hey, God, thanks for, thank you for this food. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. That was the extent of my spiritual life for today, and I'm feeling good about it. Meanwhile, all the things you've been repressing, suppressing, all the real stuff, oh, that's not even relevant to, to my prayer life. No, I'll just keep suppressing. That, that's, it's normal for me just like, no. Like, oh my goodness, n- n- no. Like, that's, that's wrong. Like, it's exactly what God is there for you. For. So he goes on to say, then you'll experience, verse 7, the next verse. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything he can, uh, we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts. That is to say, souls. And minds as you live in Christ Jesus. It actually guards your, okay, I'm saying your heart. 
is a, a metaphor for your, your, your soul, but it's also your physical heart. You know why? Because part of the list of things that sup- repression will do, along with trauma un- unhealed as a child, will lead to heart disease. Can you appreciate that? I appreciate that. It's actually literally true. Like, we have scientific evidence for it, though. Because, see, you are made, God took some earth and breathed his spirit into it, his breath into it, and man became a living soul. And so, the immaterial and material part of you, they're inextricably linked right now. So, one affects the other, back and forth. And so, like, your soul will communicate to you if you're not listening, and you, because you have very little soul awareness. It's like God is giving these mechanisms to, to like, hey, ding, 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 wake, you know, like, here's the things going on. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. There seems to be an either or there. Of course, we can do a both and. I'm going to pray for a little bit. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for this food. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I'm going to get back to worrying and ruminating. Meanwhile, you know, if I had a clock for your lifespan, it's just going like going down. That's sad? Well, the good news is, good, you know the thing about Paul in Philippians? The sacrifice he was making, it wasn't that he was going to be a martyr. He ended up being one. But it wasn't that he, the sacrifice he says he's making is not being a martyr, it's staying alive. That's the sacrifice. Okay, I'm going to stay alive. You, you say, why, is, why do you say that? Okay, do, you, do we understand Paul's consciousness? He references an experience he had. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 and following, he says, I know a man in Christ. This is Paul talking about himself because he's so humble. You know, remember we talked about those, those strict boasting categories he has, things he will not boast about and things he will boast about. This one's kind of like a gray area because it's something that happened to him. He doesn't want to boast about that, but it is something that God did. So he does want to boast. So he's kind of, he's, he, he, he reconciles those two categories in his mind by saying, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know, or out of the body, I do not know. God knows such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such, how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. What is he talking about? But like if you've had that experience, can you see how being, living in a fallen world would, would be a sacrifice for you? This is not him being morbid. Paul's sacrifice is not dying, it's living. He says in Philippians So, but in, in closing that Philippians out that way, he, he says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. This is the idea of bringing it all to God. Pouring out your negative emotions to God. That's what he's talking about. If you will do that, this is what the psalmist is leading. There's so much scripture leading us into this. If we will do that, tell God what, we, what you need. I need this pain to go away. Lord, I need to ask you like about a thousand times, why, why did you allow this to happen? What, isn't it like they say, I, I don't know, and this is off the top of my head, so I get this wrong, um, that if a child's conversations with his parents and, and, and you know, pouring out their heart and whatever could, could be a tally of, say, 8,500 hours, now, what if you missed out on that? Well, I, I prayed once, and, it, you know, and I didn't get any of that. You know, that's, your soul has, it needs more. And so the idea is we get distracted, and we don't go deep. We keep it shallow, especially if we're used to repressing. You're gonna, you want to keep it shallow. In fact, if a church goes deep, that church is not for you. Keep it intellectual for sure. Just don't talk about my pain. Don't lead me there. With, like I, That's all guard, uh, walled up. It's got a key, a lock on it. It's got a high-tech security system. I'll go anywhere, but don't go there. But that's exactly where the Holy Spirit's wanting to go because God knows what you need. So we'll distract ourselves. So it says, 
Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. What has he done? See, if we go through this process enough times, we're going to have a praise report of what he has done. Because he wants to keep it real, like in, in what you're really struggling with. He's like, yeah, they thanked me for my, the food today. Yeah, we did, did provide the food, but, you know, they weren't actually struggling with that. I'm waiting for they'll get to the point where they tell me what they're actually struggling with. Okay. But wait, there's more scripture. Uh, Matthew 6.25, I'll just give a few, they're all over the, the Bible, okay? Matthew 6.25, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough to food or drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Don't worry. And it seems like, you know, okay, the, the basic surface shallow stuff, let's, it seems like part of what that verse is communicating, that God is capable of doing more, going deeper with you. Uh, here's another one, uh, Ephesians 6.18, pray in the spirit at all times, on every occasion, stay alert, be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. So here's the thing, the idea of if I'm bearing a weight, right, a burden, if I practice those, that, that text, pray in the spirit at all times, on every occasion, like my level of amplitude stays pretty close to zero, you know, people are tracking their sleep scores these days, which is, I think, pretty cool. And you get the certain people that say, oh, yeah, I've had a perfect sleep score for the last 40 days, and here's how I did it. What if we could track our soul score? I had, I've had zero amplitude for the last 40 days, and then show you an app that proves it. Isn't that cool? Like, I've been set free. Well, what was your, what was your secret? Uh, it, was, it was Ephesians 6, 18, pray in the spirit at all times on every occasion. As soon as I, I have such soul awareness, self-awareness that I see as I don't have to repress any, anything, I bring it all to God. I've got that perfect peace he was talking about. Yeah, bad stuff is going to happen. Okay, so do you know what? Another spiritual discipline we got to talk about for just a moment is the idea of what I first encountered it in a book called Thoughts on Preaching by J.W. Alexander, a book on preaching that was written uh, in the 1800s. The idea of, he brings up this idea of mental hygiene. Do you guys have, in, in slash soul hygiene. The idea of, okay, you know, we want to stay clean, we wash our hands and stuff, but you also have to be careful what enters into your consciousness. You know what's out there? You know what there's a lot of out there? Two things I'm going to highlight. One, distraction. The other one's fear. And, the, I, and I've been hearing a lot of people saying this lately, the idea of, you know, that fear sells. Humans like fear. <gasps> oh, no. Some person, I heard him call it a uh, very wealthy, uh, wealthy, influential person, uh, called it fear porn. So the idea of some of us, and the other one I'm going to talk about is distraction. We as humans easily spend our time, our resources on secondary things instead of primary things. All the time, don't we? More, I probably more in this time. Because like the idea of having to survive and everything, a lot of our needs are, are you know, automated and there's supply chains and there's... Uh... Hmm? Semi-trucks, yes. Uh, supply chains and... Uh... You know how things are automated on a, on, a, on a conveyor belt? Not important. I'm moving on. Sorry. <laughs> Assembly lines. My goodness. We get distracted. And so here's what I'm, I'm going to, partly what I'm saying this morning offering is some of us need to have a time of fasting from social media for whether it might be video games, it might be uh, Netflix, it might be whatever, and get through this process of dealing with our past so we can get on to the future that God has called us to. Like, let's just get it done. Let's get it done. Let's get it done. 
Here's another one, Colossians 4.2. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. And here's the last one I'll, I'll give. 1 Peter 5.7. And notice this comes right before verse 8 where it warns you about your enemy, the devil. He's like a roaring lion walking around and seeking who he may devour. Notice the relationship between those two verses. 1 Peter 5.7, though, says, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. That means you can be honest with him. And again, the ultimate, for me, the ultimate example of this is Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What we take from that is there is nothing off limits that you can't pour out your heart to God, even if you're, you're tempted to blame him. It seems like God understands. Because, and I, I conclude that because I, um, the Bible teaches me and I believe that Jesus didn't sin. He was sinless. Even on the cross, God the Father, like, kind of doesn't say, oh, I was going to vindicate you. I was going to justify you. you. Quick question. This is where we're going this morning, if, well, or next week. Um, the, the justification or the vindication of Jesus was what in his earthly ministry? His resurrection. God the Father doesn't say, well, I was going to resurrect you, but that little statement you made on the cross back there, that was a little uncalled for. No, you can give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. So, I say all that to get to the point of um, this is something we need to do for us and it needs to be incorporated into part of our ministry for other people because it's just not like, okay, you need healing for yourself, but I'm just saying, let's just take, I mean, I, I want to be careful that I'm not misunderstood. Um, Jesus says stuff like, don't worry, just worry about those that can kill the body. Worry about the, the one that can throw both body and soul into hell, Okay. But can we allow the physical aspect to be motivating us for the people around? Like, oh, I'll give them the gospel one day. Like, no, wait a minute. We might not have one day. We need to hurry up. And, and can we be the person that if, if we're casting our anxiety on him because he cares for us, can we allow other people to cast their anxiety on us? And in, in that way, model be an image and likeness of who God is for people. Now, here's what I'm going to say, too, about that before we move on. I'm sure there's lots of them forgetting to say. Can't do everything from last Wednesday. Talking. Just being a shoulder they can cry on. Like, just, okay. Part of what we can do here is for our families. There should be a person if, say your family's not here. Your biological family, right? Say they're not here. Think about the, your biological family. Think about the community you inhabit, spend most of your time with. Hope you have one. Um, I think one day there'll come a time where I say, have a, a biological community, not just an AI one. Okay. Will you still come to church if it's, you can have virtual AI church online? Would a biological pastor be better than an AI pastor? We're gonna, it's going to call into question. So, oh, and by the way, there's another verse I want to quote I was thinking of last Wednesday uh, in Proverbs 14, 12, is it? I think it's repeated like, I knew at least two times, it might be three times in the book of Proverbs. There's a way which seems right to a person, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It seems right to repress. It seems right not to share. It seems to ha right to worry instead of pray. Seems right, right? Seems good. It seems better to be full of fear and worry than trust and faith and prayer. But the end thereof are the ways of death. So something to think about. We need to introduce rules of dialogue, rules of conflict resolution into our communities. Because if someone confessed, like, wow, you mean you can, you can communicate negative emotions in a positive way? Yes. 
And, and here's what I'm arguing, in case I wasn't clear, and I'm often, I feel like I'm not, is it's not just that a good idea that you, should, that you need to communicate negative emotions. You, it's a need, as a, if you're human, that you have. The question is, is it going to be destructive, or is it a be, going to be a catalyst for experiencing love? And here's the thing. As Christians, it's not just like, oh, I need you to listen. There needs to be a place where we've poured out our heart where we're able to listen for the Holy Spirit to correct us. Because truth is part of the equation. Yes? Um, and it reminds me of uh, Proverbs 19.3. It says, people make, and I'm paraphrasing here, people make a mess of their lives and then are angry at the Lord. Uh, that's not a good combination. Because if I'm angry at the Lord, but the question is there is, am I communicating it to him? So what if I am, and I'm not saying, like, maybe something I'm blaming on God was my fault. Do I want to be corrected on that? Well, yeah, if I'm a Christian, because I, I say that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. Do I believe that? Well, I want to incorporate that in my life. Here's what I'm saying. Husbands, in marriages and in families and in extended families, introduce into your culture. Do you know what culture is? Culture is a value system expressed. Those two things working together. It's your values and then the expression of those values. That creates the culture, which means we get to decide what our culture is. There's the culture at large, but there's also the culture that you're creating. You're a culture maker. And it's, it's the idea of when God said to Adam and Eve, you know, cultivate the earth. This is where we get the word. You need to cultivate in your community, displace the negative, destructive, debilitating, dysfunctional ways of uh, pouring out negative emotions, conflict resolution, either by repression or through like lashing out at each other, replace those with the positive ways. Like, and I have, you know, you say, how do I do that? Well, here's a quick list. There's lots of ways to do it, but here's one I often have used for years, rules of engagement for conflict resolution. And there's only 15 rules here. I'll give you a few examples. These are easy. Separate problem discussion from problem solving. Do not rush into problem solving until all parties have been heard out. Husbands, oh, I, I got the solution to that. Yeah, you don't even need to talk anymore. I already figured it out. <sighs> Discuss one issue at a time. Keep the conversation organized. Do not change subjects unless everyone agrees and gives permission to return to the original issue at a set later time. Three, one person has the floor at a time. This person should take time to be clear, specific, yet concise whenever possible. Do not force those listening to wait a long time before they have a chance to respond. That was a hard one for me. Like, I want, I want to keep things organized, but if someone's going to talk for 20 minutes straight, am I going to remember what they said during the first minute? If I'm, only if I'm taking notes. The second party should not rebut or answer the person with the floor. In other words, do not interrupt except for clarifying questions. Any interrupt? Don't raise your hand. Any interrupters in here? No. Don't you dare raise your hand and be. Don't be transparent with us. <laughs> See the idea when we can be transparent. When we can be transparent, it's. Uh, I see that hand. When we can't be transparent, it means my, my self-worth, my value, my identity is not based on my performance. And wh where's the scripture calling us to? Divine our identity, our worth, our acceptance, our authenticity, uh, all of it in a relationship with God. That's the rock upon which everything else gets placed. That's the one thing that's not shakable. So we can be in a storm on a boat and be asleep. Because why? We're at peace. Five, after communicating a basic idea or two, the floor should be handed over to a second party and steps three and four should be repeated. Here's the big one. Attack the problem, not the person. Like, here's how I'm feeling. Here's, here's what I'm experiencing, and I, I just need to communicate it. 
I'm not saying it's you. It's just saying, like, this is what I'm experiencing right now. Like, and through that, you feel seen, known, understood. You go around, and we can learn to do this for other people. Instead of what we see out there in the world right now is the idea of um, canceling you. Like, I destroy your presence. I, I eradicate. I, I, I want to bring your, your presence in the community. I want to bring it into oblivion so you no longer exist. Set regular, last one, set regular times for problem discussion so that things do not build up. Like we, whatever your process is, you need to have one in your family, in your marriage, in your family, so that the hardships of life can bring you guys together instead of separating you apart. And again, as I often say, what leaders do, servant leaders do, is when, when, it, when it's a problem you can't handle, your family needs to see you bringing it to the one that can handle it. And, and see, if they see you do that, then you can confess, I don't know what to do right now. I'm feeling overwhelmed too. Thus, we need to come to, to prayer, family. And our families need to hear us being honest, authentic in our prayer life. Otherwise, we're going around acting like we have to be God for everybody. So some of this we can model, and people, you know, some things are better... Uh, caught than taught, the idea of we can start practicing these things and, and people can see us doing it and then that becomes um, the warrant or the justification for them taking it on themselves. So don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. So again, what we've been talking about, and I'll say this in conclusion, what we've been talking about is we want to transition from the survival mode into like just being uh, re, re, uh, reacting to what life's throwing at us to going proactive to what God is calling us to. So what I'm saying in conclusion is I, I would love for our church as a, as a whole to go move through this process because the Lord has more things for us. Like it's the idea of you can be serving the Lord out of your shame or out of your healing. Like in, because I don't find my, my identity in God so I have to be put on this image of a super Christian and I have to serve him and, so I can feel good about myself. And, and the idea is you're... In that scenario, ministry can become your drug. The thing is, about a drug, it never will completely satisfy you. That's the frustrating thing about a drug. It will never, it'll, it'll satisfy you to some degree, but not completely. And then what our brain does is say, okay, it, it worked up to a point, so next time get more of it. Okay, that was closer. Next time, get more of it. But then you start going to that thing, and, and it, there's ever more and more diminishing returns. And then, and so what God is saying, like, I'm just trying to show you those things can't ultimately satisfy because they're not God. So I want to serve God out of, not because I have to, but because I get to. See the difference? So we can turn any good thing into a drug, any good thing into an addiction, I don't think we're going to have time for the message today uh, that I want to get to in Philippians. It's a lot of theology. It's going to set us up for a practical application. In Philippians 3, 1 through 11. Mm, it's, it's really important, important message for us because some of us, ah, I'll start, better not. Uh, any questions about what we've been talking about? Jake? Yep. Huh? Yes, that's a good, good one. Picture. Definitely. Uh, I also have a copy of the Adverse Childhood Experience uh, quiz if you want to take it. I also have a copy of the Psalms without dates on it. Uh, or I can email any of those things to you as well. So here's the thing. It's an opportunity to have a, a relationship with God, to experience his presence. And some of here's you know what a problem is I've experienced? What happens if you repress something and then you forget what you repressed? Or you weren't even conscious that you suppressed it? So, so you're walking around with something bothering you and you have no access to what it is. 
Like, I'm going to bury it, and I'm going to forget it. It's like you have, a, you have a treasure, you bury it, and you forgot to write a map, a treasure map. And you're like, oh, I need to get back there, but I, don't, I have no idea where I put it. You think, oh, I'll remember what it is, and then you forget. Because in order to remember something, you have to be triggered like a reminder. Okay, all I've been talking about there is your need for the Holy Spirit to show you some stuff. How about that for a prayer? Like, I think I've been suppressing something for so long. Holy Spirit, can you show me what it is? If you're going to pray something like that, I'm going to, what you're going to need to do is pay attention to what's going on around you in your environment. Because the, the Holy Spirit doesn't always say, whisper in a still, small voice to you. Sometimes he's going to speak to you through a person or through a circumstance. And it's the idea of when you have a relationship with God, you start paying attention to what's going on around you because you realize God is working and it's real. But practicing not only soul awareness, but Holy Spirit awareness. Like, I'm hearing that as from the Lord. And, and by the way, some people will claim that they're speaking for the Lord. A lot of people claim that. But what I want to know is, does it line up with what, what the Holy Spirit's already showed us in His Word? That's, that's critical that those things go together. Okay. We have an opportunity for ourselves and for people around us. Anybody know any broken people? What if you're the only missionary they'll ever encounter? So, the dichotomies. Bitterness or compassion. Worry or prayer life. When you begin to worry, when you begin to ruminate... Some of us, the rumination is so subterranean that we, we don't even think we're doing it. Oh, I don't have any issues with that. But if the Holy Spirit can reveal it, can we turn that to prayer? Or you say, you know what? Let the training wheels to prayer with God directly is each other in group on Wednesdays or Tuesdays. Okay, I'm going to stop so we can celebrate the Lord's. I'm going to ask for the Spirit's help. Father, we, we thank you that you care about us. You know what our needs are. Lord, why do we resist casting our care on you? Lord, I, I would ask that you would intervene so that that peace that you promised, you talked about, uh, that passes all understanding, that will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray that for your people. Lord, also for awareness of, of uh, soul awareness, Holy Spirit awareness, but broken people around us awareness. Some people are saying, oh, I don't believe in God, but Lord, we know that they're, meanwhile, addicted, and that in, addiction is an indication of their soul's need for God. And Lord, give us the wisdom and the, the discernment, the love uh, and the right tone to speak into people's lives to, to point out their, their need for their creator, their savior. But Lord, if... if uh, if a bitterness and repression has built up a stronghold in our own lives, Lord, I pray that you would tear it down by your Holy Spirit, reveal it to us. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would, would give people hope through an encounter with you. Holy Spirit, you know what you're, I'm just praying what I, what I know to pray, but Spirit, you know better than I, as Roman 8 teaches us. Uh, and Lord, thank you that you're interceding for us. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I want to invite uh, all the followers of Jesus to uh, come forward as we celebrate the Lord's... There it is. It's amazing. His uh, body was broken for us. His blood was poured out for us. He took all our sin, all our shame on himself. So this is an, taking this is also an expression of worship. But it's also, a de, as I said, a declaration to the forces of darkness whose side we are on. So I hope that gets you fired up this morning. Um, so I'd ask... Uh, the disciples, the believers uh, to come forward, take this, come to your, let's go back to our seats, let's have a time of introspection and take the message we heard and see what the Holy Spirit would, would speak to us. Let's, let's listen, let's ask Him to speak to us, give Him permission, ask, 
confession of sin, whatever it might be, and then see what the Spirit, where the Spirit will lead. Please come forward.
For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this bread, uh, eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim, that's what we're going to do this morning, the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, and having everything we said this morning, having said that, notice what he says next verse. There, Paul, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy way shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a person must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For the one who eats and drinks, eat, eats and drinks judgment to himself if... He does not properly recognize the body. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number are asleep. It's a euphemism for for death. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are uh, disciplined... And think of discipleship. We are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. What a beautiful process. This is not to guilt you and shame you. This is to introduce you to a process that your soul needs. To come before the Lord and invite Him to share with you. What are the things that the Spirit needs to speak into into my awareness, my consciousness, my soul in this moment, in this season of my life? I would say we don't want to have anything that's off limits to the Lord because of his goodness and because of his love and his power to heal. So let's declare, let's proclaim the Lord's death and declare through this that uh, all of our sin, all of our shame, everything that the enemy had against us was taken, nailed to the cross. And let's declare whose side we're, we're on, the Lord's side. Anybody here have any work to do? Any soul work? Any prayer? Time, in, time with the Lord? Just a little bit? Okay. Hey, don't miss this opportunity. Uh, it's so easy to go out of here and the storms of life overtake you and you, you forget. And the seeds that were stone, uh, s- uh, sown this morning can be gobbled up, can be choked out. Okay? Don't, let's, let's, let's just... Let's be, practice God's presence. Let's see what the Holy Spirit would have for us in this next season, okay? And we will seek to remind you of this uh, at our group uh, this week. So I want to pray for, uh, I'll close in prayer with, I want to ask for the Lord's blessing. Father, for your people, uh, each one has a a unique story, unique uh, struggles. And uh, Lord, let's pray for your Holy Spirit. Lord, lead us more into uh, the image of your son, Jesus. Uh, Lord, help us to be through our, the healing you give us more and more, the peace that you give us more and more, that we learn to communicate that with those around us who are still in a lost and, uh, and in a, a dark and broken world. Lord, help us to be a witness to the light. Lord, we need your Holy Spirit. We're praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you next week.